<laughs> All right, guys, welcome. My name is Larry Manley. I'm Carolina Division Manager. Uh, we are currently at a Raleigh team meeting in the spring of 2012. And um, this workshop is going to be on closing and dropping down, handling objections, etc. So, here we go. First thing, I could teach you how to handle every objection, but it doesn't matter if you don't have a deep product conviction. Now, you may say, what do you mean by a deep product conviction? Well, what I mean by that is not just knowing that Cutco is a great product. Anyone can tell you it's a great product. I mean, we could take the dumbest person off the streets of Raleigh and do a presentation for them, and they could say, that's a great product. Heck, we could take the dumbest person off the streets of even Chapel Hill, and they would say, hey, that's a great product, right? So, so that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, just kidding, my UNC kids, just playing. What I'm talking about is that not only is it a great product, but is it a great value? And when I was a representative, even though it was many moons ago, I felt bad leaving the house with a no-sale, not just because I had a no-sale, but I knew they would, they would probably never own Cucko. You know, I knew I had one shot to let them enjoy the product forever, to get the product in their hands and they can have it forever. And I'm not just saying this. This is the real deal. This is the truth. Is you have to believe in it that much that you want them to get the product for themselves more than just for the CPO and the commission you make. Now, is it win-win? Yeah, you make the commission, you make the sale. Yeah, that's positive. But if you're just trying to make money or the commission, it doesn't work out. Because you have to believe in what you're doing. You have to believe in the product. If you don't have that belief, you need to go look at some upscale Wustoff and, and Shun and Hinkles and, at, you know, Crabtree Valley Mall, South Point Mall, you know, some of the nicer stores. Not their cheap stuff, but their good stuff, and price it and compare it to Cutco. And you need to use your sample kit. You need to actually get the knives out and use them. If you don't believe in it that much, if you really don't believe in it like you're doing something for a client rather than to a client, that's what you need to do. If that doesn't work out, then you probably need to do something else because you know, you're not going to be that successful if you don't really believe in it. Does that make sense? All right, so understanding all that, this is under the assumption of two things. Number one, you actually believe in the product. Not just it's great, but it really is a great value for a client because they're going to use it the next 30, 40 years. Number two, you did a good presentation for a target customer. Middle-aged, middle-income, married, you know, something like that. In other words, guys, if you don't do a good presentation, I, it doesn't matter how you close. All right? Does that make sense? And if it's not for a target client, it doesn't matter. So this is all under the banner that those things are assumed. All right? So... Let's say you did page 9 and 10 in your white book. Of course, you did it word for word. Of course, you built up Hankles or Wustoff or Sean or whatever price comparison you're using. You build it up. Never mudsling the competition. Build it up. You know, that's the best you can find in a store. It's high quality. You know, it's only this much for the set. You know, that sort of thing. If you ever have a client that's like, whoa, that much? Say, yeah, but that's, I mean, this is high quality. This is going to last you a good 10, 20 years. It's good stuff. You know, defend the product that you're, you're comparing Cutco to. In other words, if they see the value in this, they're really going to see the value in cover. All right? Okay, so we get to the homemaker. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you this question. Would you like to go ahead and place an order for this set of Cutco? Entitling yourself to the super shear is absolutely free. Now, most of the time you're going to hear objections. When I was a new representative, I hated hearing objections. I was like, oh, man, how do I answer that? And a lot of it was confidence. A lot of it was I wasn't comfortable with objections. But the reality of it is, that once you sell Cutco for a while, you realize that's normal. Objections are normal, they're common, and unless they say, no, I don't want it, they're also a sign of interest. So what you want to do is interpret the ob objection. I can't afford it is really, you know, I'm not sure, but show me how I could afford it. It's too expensive is, you know, I'm not sure if it's really worth it, but it, are, is Cutco really worth it? Right? That's the, the way you interpret the objection. It's too many knives. Do you have anything smaller? Do you sell them individually? Is hey, I really love your product. I'm just not sure if I need the homemaker. Do I need all those items? In other words, objections are questions. If you're taking notes, objections are questions. I can't afford it. Is how can I afford it? All right? Unless they say, hey, no, I don't want it. I'm not interested. Very few people, though, say that if you do a good presentation. That's very rare, right? Every now and then, 
but way less than 10%. Does that make sense? So, that's the first thing you need to understand. The second thing, when you get objections, you need to do what's called clarifying objections. So there's something that's called an objection cycle, which means step number one, you agree with their objection and you clarify it. That's step number one, agree and clarify. So, tell me, Ryan, you can't afford it. I can't afford it. Okay, you can't afford it. I can understand that, Ryan. I mean, heck, you know, it's a lot of money to plunk down all at once. No problem at all. Hey, Ryan, let me ask you this. Um, is what you're saying that you, you like Cutco and you feel it's worth it, but it's a little bit too much for the budget right now? Is, is that what you're saying? Well, I like it, but, you know, it's, it's just a little expensive. I don't know that I can afford that right now. Okay, cool. But do you feel it's worth it? Mm, yeah, I can kind of see that. Okay. So you feel it's worth it, but just maybe too much for the budget? Yeah, I think you know, it's just too much for me to spend. I totally understand, Ryan. No problem at all. That's how you work through an objection to, to agree and clarify. Does that make sense? So you agree at first. Even if the customer says it's too expensive. Tell me it's too expensive. Too expensive. Okay, I can understand how you could feel that way. It, it just seems like a lot of money for knives. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay. Now, do you think it's too much money for your budget or for the knives? Well, the knives are pretty nice. Too much money. Okay. There, we took too expensive which if you don't clarify, you would think he thinks the knives cost too much. Since I clarified, it wasn't the knives cost too much, it was too much for the budget. So sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, a customer will say it's too much money, but you have to find out do they mean too much money for their budget or do they mean too much for the knives or both. Those are two different objections, by the way. Right? Two, two different... You could show them how they could afford it. What if we could break it down over 100 months with no interest? Right? Well, even a 10-year-old could afford it. But if they don't feel it's worth it, they're not going to want to afford it. So you have to clarify. Whenever you hear a money objection, the first thing to do is agree. Hey, I understand. You know, that seems like a lot of money. Or, you know, that could be a lot of money to pump down all at once. That helps you set up our five-month interest-free option, saying it that way, by the way. So if you're not getting this verbiage down, I would try to get the words down. Hey, I understand. You know, that seems like a lot of money. Or, I understand. I mean, that's a lot of money to plunk down all at once. That's good verbiage to get down, right? Just so I can make sure I understand how you feel, Mrs. Jones, and just so I can clarify. And whenever you get a money objection, here's what you want to say. Just so I can clarify. Do you feel it's a little bit too much for the product, or do you feel it's a little too much for the budget? Product or budget, that's what you want to get down. Because you have to know where they're coming from. Now, you're going to get either both, the product, or the budget. If you're doing a good presentation and you're building value, 90% of the time or more, you're going to get, it's too much for my budget. If more than one out of ten times you hear it's too much for the knives, they're nice knives, but it's just too much. I would never pay that much for knives. If you hear any variation of that, more than one out of ten times, you're not building enough value during your presentation. I can teach you what to say at this point, but you're, in, you're fighting an uphill battle. Because you had about 45 minutes to build value enough where they thought it was worth it and you didn't do it. All right? And some people you just can't get through, about one out of ten. That's okay. But you didn't do it. And so now you've got to try to rebuild value in two minutes. It's tough to do. I'll teach you what to say, but I don't want to spend too much time on that one because you shouldn't get it very often. If you do get it, here's what I would do. I'd say, hey, I totally understand. It totally seems like a lot of money for knives. And I understand that, Ms. Jones. Keep in mind, we could have used a cheap wood or plastic instead of the expensive thermo resin. Keep in mind, Ms. Jones, we could have used a straight handle instead of a special wedge lock. We could have also stopped the steel halfway and saved a few bucks there instead of using the full tank. Remember how smooth those nickel silver rivets are, Ms. Jones? How flush they are? <laughs> and how good that handle felt in your hand? We could have used some cheap brass. Nickel silver does cost more. Also, Ms. Jones, 
We could have used some cheap stainless steel instead of our special formula high carbon surgical stainless steel. It'd make it a lot cheaper. You know, Ms. Jones, we could just have a straight edge on it that doesn't cup rather than our special double D edge, too. That we grind on. And, and that'd be a lot cheaper. Of course, with that type of product, we couldn't guarantee. Having our special forever guarantee that you can pass down through generations, obviously that adds cost. But Ms. Jones, if we had a knife like that, you'd be stuck with knives like this. And we couldn't call it cut co, we'd have to call it cut no. Because it's not, it's not going to cut. All right? You know, but see what our company decided to do back in 1949 is go ahead and make the highest quality product on earth, the best product in the world. And just explain a high price one time, but never ever have to apologize for poor quality. So we got to explain a high price once, but never ever have to apologize for poor quality. Doesn't that sound like a smart business decision? Nasty. That's how I would handle that if she feels like it's too much or they feel like it's too much at the end. Does that make sense? So in a nutshell, you review all the features and benefits, go through each one, but then we'd be stuck with knives like this and you go back to the junk knife page, right? Couldn't call it cut co anymore, right? Certainly couldn't have a guarantee. But we decided as a company to explain a higher price one time, but never have to apologize for poor quality. Plus, I didn't even mention what you could throw in there again that's made in USA, which costs more too. All right, does that make sense, guys and gals? Yes or no? Yes? Good. All right, yes or yes? Okay, so let's talk more about I can't afford it. You know, hey, the knives are worth it. I love them, Larry. I just can't afford it. One thing I would always do before I even go over the five-month plan, see, most people would just say, oh, no problem, we have a five-month plan. But then it's like tug of war. It's like, I can't afford it, we got a five-month plan. Agree with them and put them at ease. So is it budget or the knives? And they're like, oh, it's just too much for the budget. Re-agree with them, put them at ease more, say, okay, I can understand that. I mean, to plunk down that kind of money at once, that's a lot of money. No problem at all. Okay. Or even if they know the five-month plan, you could be like, hey, I understand. You know, over five months, it still could be a lot of money. I understand that. No problem at all, Ms. Jones. You know what? One thing I want to make sure of. See, I don't want you to get something that you wouldn't use. But if you'd use it, it's a great investment. If you're not saying that before you, you go any further, I think that's a great thing to let them know. Hey, I don't want you to get something you'd never use. But if you'd use it, it's a great investment. That's a great thing to let the client know. Hey, I'm on your side. Now, the next question I would ask, and some of you guys have been around a while know this, the next question I would ask is, <laughs> I love it. Are there any knives, are there any of these items here that you'd never use? Right? So, so Ms. Jones, I don't want you to get something you wouldn't use. But if you use it, it's a great investment. Always use the word investment. Are there any items here that you would never use at all? Now, where does my pen always end up at? Are there any items here you never use like at all? At the carving set, right? Right in there. Are there any items here you never use? Like never over a lifetime? At all? That you would use? Ever? And see, you don't do it real, you know, you do it nonchalantly, right? Don't be like, are there any odd knives you can use? Like those two? Right? Don't do that. Just do it casually. Are there any items you can never use at all? Because we know if there are items they wouldn't use very often, it's that. And that helps you lead into the gap. Does that make sense? Now, one thing that's real important is you have to do a great names and uses page during your presentation. If you're getting a lot of people say, oh yeah, I would never use any of those big ones. I'd just use those small ones. That will happen sometimes, but if you have that happen very frequently at all, that means you need to do a better presentation on this page, i.e. more names and uses, more questions on names and uses, painting pictures, cutting up food, 
Now you might be like, Larry, painting pictures, I heard about that, but I'm not very good at that. Tomorrow when you call PDI, tonight at Team Night Out, ask anybody in the back of this room, Raleigh team, on the video, ask your managers, how can you paint pictures better? Because you're not going to have a big average order, and you're not going to sell very many homemakers and galleys, let alone SIGs and, and Altis, if you don't paint pictures. Does that make sense? So if you get a bunch of people say, oh, oh, I, I, I would only use these small ones. Oh, those big ones scare me. Ooh. Right? <laughs> you ever have a customer say that? Oh, I'm scared of big knives, right? You got to show them how to, how to do it. You got to, even without the knife, you have to show them how to use the chef knife with your pen and explain it, even if it's not your kit. And how safe it is. How much time it saves. Okay? Let's assume they say, so, you know, I wouldn't want you to get if you wouldn't use it. Are there any items you'd never use? No, I use them all, Larry. I love them. You just got to call me a few months from now, right? You ever get that one? Call me in a couple months. Okay. <laughs> not now means never. Mm. It's not like, guys, if they're 40 or 50 years of age, right? Think about a 50-year-old saying, call me in two or three months. They've had the last 30 years to save up a couple hundred dollars of expendable income. If they haven't been able to save up $200 of expendable income in the last 30 years, how are they going to do it in the next two months? Right? You guys see what I'm saying? All right. So my point of saying that to you is let them know, hey, no problem. I could call you in a few months. Put them at ease. I could do that. So, But you like it and you use it. It's just a money problem. Hey, no problem at all. Then what I like to do, guys, is juice up the first call specials. Because I've only offered them the super shares, haven't I? So in this case, what I would do is break it down on paper. All right? I'd break it down on paper. All right? So what I would do is break it down on paper over five months. <coughs> Alright, you guys know your prices, right? How much is a homemaker plus eight? Uh, Only 1079, right? <coughs> so we have the homemaker plus eight. Over five months, how much is it? About 220 something, right? So I like to write the word about right here. Put 220. Circle it. Now I don't like to write 225 times. I like to write the word down real small right here. Alright? Then since right now that, that, that we're taping this, it's around mid-February, right? So then I would put mid and underline it so I don't have to write mid four more times. I'd put mid M-A-R, A-P-R. May and June. Okay? So it's down mid March, April, May, and June. Now, when I cover with a client, I'm not going to say it's down, then it's another one in mid March, then you've got to come up with 220 more dollars in mid April. And heck, we're only, get, but let's show if we're halfway done. Right? I'm not going to say it like that. Okay? Here's how I cover with a client. Ms. Jones, check out what we could do for you. I know I, I mentioned this verbally to you already, but check out what we could do for you. And I'd slide the piece of paper facing them. A little tip, by the way, is go to their side of the table. If you guys were my husband and wife and I was presenting it to you two, I would go to the husband's side of the room because I'm a guy, and I'd kneel down beside the husband and show it to you. Right? If I was a lady, which I'm not, but if I was, I'd go to the lady side. If obviously, if it's just a housewife there, just go around that side of the table, right? Kneel down and explain it to them. The reason you do that is psychologically you get on their side of the table. Then I'd say, here's what we can do for you. Now notice, there's no super shears written yet, right? I've already flipped through my gifts and accessories. If you haven't done that, start doing that before you go through page 9 and 10. I already know that her, something that caught her eyes... The husband and wife, something that caught their eyes was the entertainer pack. They really like that. That's a big ticket item to give away, right? And on a, on a homemaker, usually we just give away one thing. Watch how I explain this and how I do the free stuff. All right? Here's what I would do. I'd say, hey, Miss Jones, 
I know it may be too much for you right now, and you don't have to do this. But I know that you would love Cutco forever. So here's what I would do for you. We could get you your Homemaker Plus A, all right? It's only this much here. Do not say it's 1,079 of your hard-earned dollars in the palm of my hand. Just point to it and say it's only this much here. <laughs> we could break it down over five months with no interest. It'd be about this much down. Then again in mid-March, April, May, and June, the mid of every month. Okay? Now, Mrs. Jones, just so you know, that's only about $55 out of a whole week's budget. That's it. All right? It's not even a trip to the grocery store. Now, what we could do for you is give you those super shares you love for free. 